Chapter 1, The Danger Zone The 139th Street NFL crew was a notorious crew from West Harlem. NFL stood for niggas for life. The crew's name symbolized the unity and loyalty amongst its members. If you ask anybody about NFL, that's what they would say about us, like unity. NFL was from West 139th Street between Lenox Ave and 7th Ave. The original three members who started NFL were Reg, Lee, and TC. They were well known and widely respected all over Harlem. NFL was very protective of their territory. Lee was born in 1969 in Harlem, New York. Lee was a hustler. He was the elder brother of rapper Big L. Reg was born on August 13th, 1967, in Harlem, New York. Reg was the most congenial. He was the one that people got along with the most. As a youngster, he competed in the Golden Gloves competition. T.C. was born in 1965 in Harlem, New York. And T.C. was like a fighter, definitely a fighter. Like, you know, he would fight before he would pick up a gun. He grew up on 139th Street with his brother, G. G was a cool dude, man. If he rode with you, he rode with you. Chapter 2. High on your own supply. Marv was a drug dealer from Harlem. Marv was, uh, he was an older guy who was already in the drug game. In the mid-1980s, Marv took Reg under his wing and introduced him to the drug game. Marv put Reg down with him. Shortly thereafter, Reg became acquainted with Ernie, a wholesale drug supplier. Ernie was a Dominican guy from 141st Street and Hamilton Place, Manhattan. Around 1987, Marv was shot dead in his apartment. Reg was deeply saddened by the loss of his friend and mentor. Reg partnered up with Lee and TC and took over Marv's spot on 139th Street. Customers would walk up to the hole and stick their money in a the hole. They also recruited a guy named Shake from 140th Street. Reg introduced the new crew to Ernie. Marv's connect was Ernie. The money started coming in fast. Business was booming. They decided to step it up a notch and move their operation into a new building. There was a Jamaican gang selling drugs out of the same building. In order to avoid confusion, the two crews used different colored wild caps. Things were going well until Reg and TC noticed Ernie gave them less work when they went to re-up. They started investigating and found out Shake was getting high on their own supply. Shake had started getting high. They also discovered Lee was skimming off the top and pocketing the profits. That was the first sign that Lee showed of being deceitful. Despite this betrayal, TC and Reg still forgave Lee. TC, Reg was hurt by him and it was like, how could he take from us? From there on forward, TC and Reg worked one week, Lee and Shake worked the next. 
Chapter 3 The Jamaicans It soon became apparent that there was a problem with the new arrangement. Ernie would stop giving them work on credit and would accept cash only. They didn't have enough money to purchase large quantities of work. The Jamaican crew saw this as an opportunity to steal their customers. One day, TC and Reg got into a dispute with a member of the Jamaican crew. The Jamaican pulled out a gun and threatened TC. TC and Reg were unarmed at the time and therefore decided to walk away. Later that night, the Jamaican was shot and wounded. TC and Reg were allegedly responsible for the shooting. The Jamaican crew abruptly packed up and left the building. But then they came back and got into a shootout with Lee and Shake. The Jamaican crew came out on the losing end of the battle. They left the building and never came back. Lee and Shake were charged with attempted murder and weapons possession. Shake was released on his own recognizance and Lee was released on bail. Shake and Lee went straight back to dealing drugs. T.C. and Reg were no longer selling drugs on the block. Instead, they started robbing crack houses and street-level dope dealers. Reg, Lee, T.C. And, and Shake had messed up money somehow. They didn't have money to re-up, but they closed their spot for a while. T.C. and Reg, they were like walking by the block and they went and checked on the spot. There was a, a guy inside Jamaican guy directing traffic away from the door like tell him don't go over there everything is over here he stepped to the Jamaican guy he told him you know what up like just don't do that so the guy pulled out a gun and TC and Reg came back the guy was standing on the stoop so they just started shooting at him Reg and TC basically they left the spot alone and Lee and Shake they were hustling together and got into a beef with the Jamaicans I don't know what this one was for exactly this is when they had to shoot out again. I remember that clear as day. Like, I heard the shots. I came and looked out the door. I stood outside. I looked up the block. I saw Lee standing in the middle of the block, just shooting into the building. It looked crazy, but he was a, a, a firm believer in holding down and protecting the block, the buildings, and he was a thorough dude when he needed to be. Chapter 4 the stick-up kids. Black Tone was a drug dealer from 139th Street and Lenox. He was a close friend of Lee's. Gus's bar was located on Lenox Avenue. Black Tone was selling coke to customers inside the bar. In 1988, Reg, Lee, TC, and a guy named Lime robbed Gus's bar. 
Black Tone allegedly acted as an inside man. They then attempted to rob an after-hours social club. During the robbery, they were interrupted by police officers. The officers arrested and charged the group with armed robbery. They were later ROR'd, but then arrested again and sent to Rikers Island. A few months later, they were released on bail pending sentencing. Eventually they took a plea deal and were scheduled to be sentenced on November 16, 1989. While awaiting sentencing, Lee went back to dealing drugs in the building. TC started hustling in the park. The park was located between the 139th Street and 140th Street. TC was the first one out of the crew to hustle in the park. TC invited his cousin Lou Black to join him. Lee decided he wanted a piece of the action and opened his own spot in the park. You know, back in the days, there was no fence around the park. He was able to walk in. Uh, they had different, various different entrances from 139th Street to 140th Street. Uh, I never knew that they even called it Frederick Samuels until they actually put a fence up there and then put the sign up there. From back in the days in the 70s, and we never had a name for the park. That just was our park. You know what I mean? We came out the house and we went and played in, in the park. And then when we got older, we hustled in the park and. And, you know, everything was just, that's where we hung out. That was what we were known for. Those guys from 139th Street, 139th and Lennox. Big L, he called it the danger zone. And that's what it's basically has been called since he made the record. Um, but, you know, back in the days, it was just our park. We played, we loved each other, and we grew up. It was our park. Lee's spot up the block, he still had the spot up the block, but it wasn't doing as well as TC was doing. He said he wanted to uh, see if he could come down in the park and get some money like T was getting. And she seems to be fine, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, his motto was, I want for my brother what I want for myself, so why not? There's enough money. So they got money in the park. TC had red tops, I believe, and Lee had green tops, if I'm not mistaken, if my memory serves me correctly. And they got money side by side in the park. I even got down with my cousin, and, you know, I was hustling every day and at night and then doing it all again every day, making thousands and thousands of dollars every day. Chapter 5 paid in full. Rich Porter and Alpo were major players in the Harlem drug trade. They were planning on flooding 139th Street with crack. In 1989, they asked Reg, TC, and Lee to head the operation. Reg, T.C., and Lee had to turn down the offer due to their impending prison sentences. Alpo and Rich told them the offer would still be on the table when they got out. But a few months later, Rich was murdered and Alpo left Harlem and moved to D.C. On November 16, 1989, Reg, T.C., and Lee began to serve their sentences. A few years later, they were released from prison. T.C. went back to the old building and started hustling again. T.C. was hustling back in the old building after he cleared everybody out. T.C. and Reg went up there and they just said, listen, everybody gotta go. Every now and then, T.C. would get work from a guy named Leon. Mm -hmm. 
Leon was the brains behind the lynch mob. The lynch mob was a notorious drug crew from 142nd Street and Lenox. He was getting his hands on work from here and there, whatever, but he was also getting supply from the leader of the lynch mob. Lee, on the other hand, was now hustling in the park. Lee came home and he was hustling in the park. He didn't want anybody else hustling in the park. And he made that clear to everybody. No matter how long he knew us, how we grew up together, whatever, he didn't care if we got money or not. He took the park for himself, marked his territory, and that was it. He didn't want nobody hustling in the park. Now, you know, people were doing their own thing, so they really didn't give a shit. You know what I'm saying? It's like he came home, staked his claim, you know what I mean? Marked his territory, and that was it. Nobody cared because nobody was hustling in the park. But he turned it up and he made it like, you know, he made it work, like work work. He really, really turned it up way more than he money than he was getting before. Reg had got his hands on some work from a guy who had a little connect with the mob or whatever, whatever. And he gave Reg a whole kilo. That's when they broke the whole kilo down to a dollar bottle. That has never been done in our block before. Probably been done in other blocks, but that was a rarity back then. He sold the dollar bottles and did the whole kilo and like really, really turned it up. And it was crazy for them back then. But the relationship was different with Leroy and everybody when he came home. Because when he came home, like I mentioned in the book, he referred to everybody as homeboy. Like everybody was his homeboy. It's like his attitude was different towards people when he, uh, when he came home. And, uh, you know, he wasn't like that all the time. You know, he was cool, but, you know, he just like, it was just something, it was the air about him that was different. Chapter 6, Harlem Legends During the 80s and 90s, crews in Harlem were known for throwing street parties. Crews like the Best Out, Same Gang, Final Four, All Stars, and Slick in the Family. Lee thought it would be a good idea to join the Harlem party circuit. Reg and TC agree to the idea. Next, they needed a name for their crew. TC suggested they call themselves NFL, Niggas for Life. For their first ever event, they decided to host a basketball game in the park. They asked the best stop to play against them. In 1992, NFL held the first annual Memorial Basketball Game. While we were in jail, you know, we heard in the streets how, like, local crews are giving parties and stuff, like, um, the Best Out, Same Gang. Same Gang had a guy by the name of D. Ferg in the crew, and, uh, you know, they were hustling but they were also throwing parties and stuff like that. D Ferg is the father of the rapper ASAP Ferg. He's part of the ASAP mob and a uh, really good dude. They were throwing parties. And you know, we were hearing about all that stuff when we would come home, like, dang, you know, we need to get to those parties, this and that, and the other, whatever. So when we came home, you know, I think it was Lee who came up with the idea, like, yeah, we used to throw our own parties and stuff like that. But you know, we didn't have a name, like nobody really, dealt with us. We was the dudes from 139th Street who, you know, they was always fighting and, you know what I'm saying, no one for carrying guns and stuff like that. Plus, they went away for armed robbery, you know what I'm saying? The three of them, they went away for armed robbery. So it's like, that's the kind of reputation that they had in the streets. No nonsense, cool, but no nonsense dudes. And, and you know, if they need be, they got busy. So in order to mix and mingle, so to speak, or integrate into that, that world, into throwing the parties and stuff like that, you know, TC came up with the name NFL, Niggas for Life, because we needed a name, you know what I mean? We couldn't be like, yo, 139th Street against, or, or, or 139th Street throwing a party, like, what? Everybody had a name, so TC gave us a name. We thought of the name NFL, Niggas for Life, that's how we roll, you know what I'm saying? We was, we was, we was boys, we were, brothers for life you know what i mean the purpose of the game was instead of throwing a party first we were known for the park everybody know 139th street everybody knew the park 
So in order for everybody to, to get to know us, we gave ourselves a name, but we also wanted to play uh, a basketball game to memorialize people who had died around our way. But we had it in the park Memorial Day weekend. We wore the NFL jerseys. That was like, you know, our correlation with NFL, Niggas for Life. And that's the reason why we were wearing the NFL jerseys. We played the best out, but the best out did not want to be called the best out for that particular game because they didn't have all their key players. They were from 141st Street and 142nd Street, those two blocks. For that game, they called themselves the 141 crew. Dame Dash was a part of that crew. There's a lot of them. There's a really good picture of them, but mostly all of them in the picture. Really good dudes, you know. Rel Mack was the, uh, uh, he, I wouldn't say he was the leader. There's no leader really like that. He was like the dude in the forefront of the crew, you know, maybe like the, the face of the crew. And he also had uh, Final Four, some other guys who were giving parties, but their parties was like in 94, 95, Final Four, All-Star, they came a little later, but definitely worth mentioning, All-Star crew. Um, matter of fact, Jewel, who owns the Felon Magazine, the one who put my uh, interview in his magazine, he's the forefront of the All-Star crew. So, you know, they were throwing parties and doing stuff like that. And, you know, it was just all love in Harlem. Crews would play against crews and basketball games. And that's basically what that was about as far as the name and the first basketball game. That was the story behind that. Around 1993 or 1994, NFL held another successful event. They played against the same gang at Gaucho's Gym in South Bronx. D. Ferg was responsible for the printed shirts both teams wore during the game. He was also known for printing logos and shirts for record labels, including Bad Boy. After the first annual Memorial Basketball game, there was a party in the park. During the party, a man pulled out a gun and started shooting into the air. Reg's cousin went over to the man and told him to put the gun away. One thing led to another and it turned into a fight. The man came out on the losing end of the scuffle and fled the scene. Later that evening, the same man shot and killed Reg's cousin. Reg was determined to avenge his cousin's death. A few weeks later, the killer was sitting in line in a Wendy's drive-thru. There was also a passenger in the vehicle. Reg and G walked up to the vehicle and opened fire. Both occupants of the vehicle died at the scene. It turned like into a little party in the park after the game, you know. The legendary love bug Starsky, he's now deceased, you know, he was DJing in the party, you know. Later on that night, you know, after it got dark, a guy from 38th Street, he was he was from 38th Street, people know him, everybody know him, you know what I mean? Which is surprising why he did it, because he grew up with Reg's cousin in the same block, and Reg's cousin was from the block as well, 138th Street as well, so he knew him. They got into a fight, Reg's cousin got the best of the guy and uh, I guess his pride was hurt and maybe you know an hour or so a couple of hours or whatever later you know every after the party was gone or, you know was dead or whatever everybody left the park and they were standing on the corner you heard some shots about three blocks away he got killed in between 137th and 136th street on Lenox Ave after he shot him or whatever he like a few minutes later or whatever he walked past 139th street Reg and it was outside the guy walked by when he walked by 
he had that look on his face, you know, like after this, when somebody do something, if, you, if you're not used to doing it or whatever, you know, he still had that mad look on his face, like whatever, you know what I mean? Like I'm that nigga, I'm, I'm tough. You know, he just had that look after he did something. And you know, Reg knew him. So Reg like, you know, he was like, yo, like, what's wrong with you? Like, you all right, man? He was like, yeah. He just said, yeah, kept it pushing, kept walking. He actually went to 142nd Street where the lynch mob was from, where they hung out. Because he was actually cool with one of the guys in the lynch mob. I guess he was going over there to like, you know, let him know, listen, man, I had a problem with this and that and other, I handled my business, whatever. That's just an assumption, but that's the direction he was walking. And we, we it's a known fact that he used to run with, he was like an affiliate of those guys. After that, you know, people talked, he talked maybe, and found out, you know, it got back to Reg that this is, he's the guy who shot his cousin. He walking around, riding around through the, in the block, through the block, like it's nothing, like he didn't, like whatever. So, you know, Reg used to see him, you know, he used to make his blood boil, like I'm gonna catch him. When I catch him, his ass is mine. One night, I was in a car about a block away when I heard the shots. And I was like, oh shit. So I had her drive me up the block. Now there was a Wendy's on the corner of my block, 139th Street and 7th Avenue. There was a Wendy's there and it was a drive-through. Before the shots, what happened was when they drove up the block, they got stuck in traffic. So Reg was able to see. So he told G, yo, go get your thing. You know what I'm saying? Go get your thing, you're gonna catch these niggas up there at the light, you know what I'm saying? Or if they stop or whatever, you're gonna catch them. Just so happens, they went through the drive-through and they were sitting there. G and Reg walked up the block. Reg came from the driver's side. G came from the passenger side. Reg it startled him, but he knew he had a gun in the back. He had a gun, either he was wrapped in a t-shirt or a towel in the back seat. So he tried to turn around to get to his gun. But, you know, Reg was already shooting. That was Reg's first body, that was G's first body. And they walked down the block. That was that. Several months later, Reg and G were arrested and charged with double homicide. A witness had come forward with information which led to the arrests. Reg and G were sent to Rikers Island. It was here that G joined the Nine Trade Gangsters. The Nine Trade Gangsters were a set of the United Blood Nation, UBN. UBN was established in 1993 on Rikers Island. He was locked up on an island. He became blood. He was, became part of the Nine Trey Bloods. A few months later, Reg and G made bail. They then discovered that the witness was a friend of G's. Not long after that, G's friend was no more. A year later, Reg and G were arrested again. But this time, it was for a murder and attempted murder charge in Brooklyn. Both men maintained their innocence. They were sent back to Rikers Island. A month later, Reg was released and the charges for the Brooklyn case were dropped. G continued to languish in prison after being identified in a police lineup. When the case finally went to trial, he was found not guilty on all charges. Wendy's shooting charge was still hanging over him and Reg. The 
case was eventually dropped due to lack of evidence and no witnesses. When he was locked up on an island, he became blood. He was became part of the nine tray bloods, nine three. His allegiance was always to the block or whatever, to Reg, but you know, he still had his affiliates. He had his people that he fucked with that was down with the Bloods. G was still going back and forth to trial for the, uh, the murder and attempted murder. G had never been through anything like that before. You know, Reg already did a bid and whatnot. So they tried to, I guess they tried to figure G was the weakest link and tried to get on the roll on, on, on to testify against Reg or, or snitch on Reg, but you know, G wasn't having that. He just wasn't that type of guy. He went to trial, and luckily he beat him. He beat it because lack of evidence. The attempted murder victim testified that the guy who shot him was actually tall enough to breathe right in the back of his neck or something like that. And this is what G told me personally out of his mouth. That in trial, that's what happened, and the lawyer beat that. He ate that part up. I guess that's part of what won the case for him because, you know, G was shorter than the guy. So he was, <laughs> he couldn't have been breathing on the back of his neck if he was so much shorter than him case against him with the Wendy's incident was dropped as well for lack of evidence and no witness. You know, back then they didn't have cameras on the street and all of that like they do now. People got away with a lot more shit than they can get away with now. Eventually they were back home and everybody was home on the street again. Chapter 7 Protection Money Mike was a drug dealer who was selling PCP out of a building on 140th Street. He shared the building with another drug dealer named Sunday. Sunday was getting his supply from the lynch mob. Sunday was later killed after an alleged discrepancy with the lynch mob. The lynch mob wanted to move into the building and kick Mike out. Mike approached Lee and asked him if he could help resolve the issue. told Reg and TC to be on standby in case something should happen. One day, Lee saw a guy named Homicide Lou pull up outside Mike's building. Lou was an enforcer for the lynch mob. Reg, Lee, and TC approached Lou while he was talking to Mike outside of the building. Lee and Lou exchanged words. Reg quickly stepped in to prevent the situation from spiraling out of control. Out of respect for Reg and TC, Lou agreed to let Mike keep the building. Shortly thereafter, Mike started to pay protection money to Reg, Lee, and TC. Mike, unbeknownst to Reg and Lee, we found out later on that he was also giving Lou uh, money. If you don't have any protection, you don't have any backbone, you don't have nobody holding you down, you know, they'll come get you, they'll come rob you, they'll come extort you. Back in the 80s and 90s when it was like that. For some reason, I guess he had a, an agreement with Lou. Like Lou looked out for him and everything. And while Reg, TC, and Lee were gone, they were upstate. That's when he was paying Lou. Lou's MPV came down the block. He had a white MPV. Niggas knew when that white MPV came through. You know what I mean? Listen, man, look out. Just, you know what I mean? Like, he wasn't always on no bullshit, but you know, you see him, just be aware of him. Got out, he was talking to Mike on the stoop in front of the building. And they, they went over, chopping it up. Like, seeing what, what was the problem? Just holding Mike down, basically. So when they got there, um, Lee asked Mike, was he all right? And Lou was like, yeah, yeah, I. And Lou was like, I wasn't talking to you. And Lou said, well, yeah, well, I'm talking to you, though. Lee was a hothead. 
definitely a hothead. Like I said, he was no sucker. Not in the least. In a confrontation like that, he would have handled his business. He was no sucker. And Lou's reputation spoke for itself. So Reg saw that it was going to escalate. Neither one of them would have backed down. He intervened. He was the, the voice of reason in the situation. Lou wasn't no, uh, he wasn't an unreasonable man all the time. So I guess, you know, he relented. Like, okay, well, I, on the strength of you, I let him live. But make sure that y'all get money from him. You know what I'm saying? Because basically, he like, yo, he's, he's a sheep. You know what I mean? And he knew the Reg and Leeds. He did. Y'all wolves, man. Y'all a different level, different caliber nigga. Like, make sure y'all get money from that nigga, man. And that basically was that. But he told Reg, like, listen, man, your man, like, he, you know, he got an attitude problem, basically. You know what I'm saying? Like, yo, he gonna get, keep y'all in some problems, man, because his attitude in his mouth and whatnot. You know what I mean? So basically what happened after that was Mike, he began letting Lee, Reg, and TC get some of the dust money over there on 40th Street as a compensation or whatever for the protection that they were now provide. So they add another outlet. They were getting money over there with the dust. That's how that went. Chapter eight, The Lyrical Beast. Big L was born on May 30th, 1974. He grew up on 139th Street in Lenox with his two brothers, Lee and Don. Instead of living the street life, he chose rap as a way out. In 1992 or 1993, he signed to Columbia Records. In 1995, Big L released his debut album, Lifestyles of the Poor and Dangerous. His song, Danger Zone, was an ode to 139th Street in Lenox. This was NFL's signature theme song when they came out onto the court. In the mid-1990s, Big L and Jay-Z had a rap battle on Lenox Avenue. One night, Big L was in a gambling spot on Lenox Avenue. Also present was TC and his godbrother, Fella. That night, Big L lost his money and he lost his temper. In an unprovoked moment of madness, Big L threw a punch at Fella. Fella fought back and Big L came out on the losing end of the slugfest. A week later, Lee got into a confrontation with Black Tone. The argument quickly escalated and Black Tone shot Lee twice in the leg. The incident ended their long friendship. In 1996, Big L got out of his record deal and went independent. Jay had come around with Dame. Dame's from Harlem and you know, he knew Big L was from Harlem. So, you know, that's what, you know, back in the day, that's what people do. They, they go to the different hoods and they battle and whatnot. It had started on 140th and Lennox Avenue between 140th and 141st. I think Jay Rhyme was first. And then after Jay Rhyme, L Rhyme. But um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, they might have taken it to the park, but I had left. But those two rounds that I heard, you know, in my opinion, you know, it was, it was about a tie. Like I said, I don't remember the year. I forgot what year it was. I think it was before both of them had deals, if I'm not mistaken. Dame would go around everywhere and take Jay places and they would battle and stuff. But that was a, a good battle in the, in the hood. 
another time I mentioned in the book when they had a real, real session, they, did, they didn't say that they were battling when they were down the stretch of Barbados. Or, or it was a college radio show that, matter of fact, if you go to Netflix, they have a, a documentary on stretching Barbito. It talks about their radio show. Almost every hip hop head that was relevant from the 80s and 90s was on the stretching Barbito show. If you didn't make it to the stretching Barbito show, you wasn't even really a rapper back then. So that battle was, uh, it wasn't really a battle. They didn't say it was a battle, but you know, one the MC rhyme, the other one rhymes, and they spitting their shit. So, you know, they were going back and forth. But uh, I would say it was like an informal battle. They wouldn't admit it, but you know, that was like, that was crazy. I think it's on the internet somewhere too. You, know, you can get your hands on it. It's, uh, it's classic, man, it's classic. Yeah, Jay and, and, and L, they, you know, they didn't go at it, but they was like lyrically, they battled each other. Lyrically, they uh, they competed with each other back then. We know where Jay, Jay is the juggernaut in the game right now. You know what I mean? He's been for years. I can imagine if L wasn't, his life wasn't taken so early, how he would have progressed and how he would have grown as well lyrically, because he was a lyrical beast back in the day. Him and Biggie on the track, him and Pac on the track, him and Jay on the track. More tracks, because Jay was on his first album. He was definitely a uh, part of the culture, the underground scene, and he was great for hip hop back then, definitely. Chapter nine, revered, feared, and respected. In 1997, Lee was arrested and charged with carrying a firearm. He paid his bail and was subsequently released. Reg had formed a friendship with a guy named Nichols. Nichols was from Queens, New York. Nichols had previously worked as a road manager for Tupac Shakur. In 1994, Nichols was shot along with Tupac at Quad Studios. Reg and Nichols allegedly started doing stick-ups together. In the summer of 1997, Nichols introduced Reg to a guy named Black Just. Black Just was a high-ranking member of the Supreme Team Drug Crew. Black Just and Reg spoke about doing business together. That same year, Reg robbed a close friend of rapper Biggie Smalls. Biggie's friend was robbed of his diamond-encrusted chain in a restaurant. It was a similar chain to the one Biggie wore in an episode of the TV show Martin. Lee's relationship with Reg and TC had become strained. Reg was respected everywhere he went, and it was said that Lee was envious of him. In 1997, Lee's cousin was shot dead outside of his apartment building. An unconfirmed rumor began circulating that Reg was the shooter. Lee never asked Reg if there was any truth to the rumor. Instead, he just stopped talking to him. He was on our way back to Harlem, and, uh, you know, Lee was on his bullshit. You know, he called him Reg, like Queens Reg, and, you know, he ain't down in the NFL no more. He's a Supreme Team nigga, he Queens nigga, whatever. He doing this in front of everybody. Like, it ain't no shame in his, you know what I mean? His way, that's just the way he felt. And he just, he showed it. Niggas just looking at him like he was crazy, like this. He was bucking, you know what I mean? Like, he was upset because of who Reg was talking to, basically. Lee was the type of dude that he was like really unapproachable. 
because of his demeanor and whatnot. Niggas ain't really fuck with him like that. But Reg was a dude that was, he was real amicable. Everybody, you know, could approach him. He was approachable, he was lovable. You know, people talk to him or whatever. You know, he did his thing whenever he did it, but he was still easy to communicate with. On the other hand, you know, Rick Lee was the opposite. Lee, if his demeanor was different, he could have been afforded the same opportunities as Reg. He just didn't look at things that way. As far as the chain, it was definitely when I, I looked at the episode of Martin when Biggie was on Martin and that was definitely the same crossing chain. But I don't know if it was the exact same one that Reg took. You know what I'm saying? But Reg caught the dude slipping when he went in the Chinese restaurant. He hit him with a body shot and the dude, you know, stumbled over and Reg got him. You know, the dude came over and tried to get the chain back to whatever Reg wasn't having that. You know what I mean? Reg was like, I'm not. He told him to get it in blood. You know what I'm saying? Niggas want his chain back, he gotta, he gotta get it in blood. I'm not gonna call Biggie man names, so he's a, <laughs> he's a go hard nigga too, man. You know what I'm saying? He's a go hard nigga, but you know, he got caught slipping. Chapter 10 Disloyalty. Every Sunday, there was a hip hop night at the Tunnel Nightclub in New York. One Sunday, Big L borrowed Reg's chain to wear to the club. The following night, Big L asked if he could borrow the chain again. Reg gave him the chain and Big L left the scene. A few moments later, Reg was shot multiple times by an unmasked man. Lee and his friends heard the gunshots and immediately arrived on the scene. They lifted Reg up and put him into an MPV van and drove to Harlem Hospital. Unfortunately, the medical staff were unable to revive Reg. Reg died on September 22, 1997. Rumors began to circulate that Lee ordered a hit on Reg. Prior to the murder, a man resembling the shooter was seen hanging around with Lee. It was said that Lee took an unnecessarily longer route to the hospital. In December 1997, Lee was sentenced to five years in prison for the firearm case. Big L was in the process of signing with Rockefeller Records. In February 1999, Dame offered to sign Big L and members of his rap crew. Lee was in prison devising a plot to have Tone, TC, and G killed. While serving his sentence, Lee befriended a shooter from Brooklyn. G was the first target on Lee's hit list. They put him in the van. And Lee's MPV van, they drove up the block. They sat at the light. I emphasized it in the book, but I emphasize it to you. Like, if you have somebody who's bleeding, <laughs> why would you wait at the light? You know, I mean, they waited for the light, the light turned green. They made the left, they drove to 136th Street. They made another left and drove down the block to 136th and Lenox Avenue, and then drove to the emergency room. Now, people who, who walked from 139th Street to 136th Street, got to the hospital before Lee got to the hospital and he was in a car. That was peculiar right there. That didn't make any sense. How somebody could walk faster than a car, but you know, it is what it is. Chapter 11, Murder for Hire. 
After he was released from prison, the Brooklyn shooter linked up with Big L. Lee had instructed Big L to help the shooter identify the target. Big L was trying to set G up for the kill. One day, G noticed he was being followed by the shooter. Sensing danger, G acted like he had a gun and chased the man away. Big L made the mistake of telling someone about the hit on G. A few days later, Big L was shot to death on 139th Street in Lenox. He was shot nine times in the face and chest by a masked gunman. Rumors began circulating that G was the shooter. They never had a beef. Like CC never had a beef with him. G never had a beef with him. They never had no beef like that. The purpose of hitting G and CC is unbeknownst to anybody. I don't understand why he would try to hit them. The only thing I could think of is that they were the closest ones to Reg and they were offered a resistance. While he was away, he was trying to eliminate his enemies before he came home so he could come home peacefully. Now, mind you, this is theory. This is all theory. This is just my thinking of what a, a thinking man would do if he had the power to do so. If you go on YouTube and look up anything about Big L, it was a tribute I think his brother did, his brother Don did when he came home. They did the mural over in the home 40th Street for Big L. It's a big cookout you know, party and everything, there's music out there, they was having food and everything, celebration of Big L and all that, which is fine, you see, I have no problem with that, I love Big L, I always love him, you know what I'm saying, my dude. On that interview, Don is wearing a yellow hoodie. The interviewer asked him about the Big L hit, and Don tells him out of his own mouth, it was a situation, this is almost verbatim, it was a situation between, like, divide and conquer between us guys in the block, or whatever, and then Lee was in jail, he sent somebody to do something to somebody. He sent L with him. L wasn't supposed to go with him, but his face was seen, and that was that. He said it himself, that it was a plot to hit G. He didn't say G's name, but it was a plot to hit him. Unbeknownst to NFL, they were being investigated by the FBI. In 1999, FBI agents arrested and charged G, Don, and six other men. The FBI claimed that the NFL crew was an organized murderous drug gang. But these allegations were false and misleading. NFL was not working together as a unit. G was also charged with the murder of Big L. but the murder charge was later dropped due to insufficient evidence. Rather than take their case to trial, G and his co-defendants accepted a universal plea deal. G received the sentence of four years in prison. In 2002, Lee was released from prison. The investigation with NFL started uh, because of the murders and the robberies and the drugs. He was going to try to give us the RICO Act. By placing us under that act, they would be able to give us more time. We weren't all getting money together. Lee was getting his money in the park and he was a different faction of NFL. I was getting money up the block. I was a different faction of NFL. We were only NFL because we came together for parties, we came together for basketball games, we came together just as a brotherhood. Reg was doing his robberies and whatever he was doing, it had nothing to do with Lee. 
feds didn't care about that. They wanted to lump everybody together because we all lived on the same block, basically. But the investigation ended when Reg got killed. So they were going to try to tie the drugs in with the murders and the robberies and stuff like that. So the investigation kind of fell apart with that. When Lee went away, he still had people in place running his business. And this is where it becomes tricky because everybody who was down with Lee wasn't in the NFL. He had recruited guys from 140th Street. He moved his business from 139th Street to 140th Street. Some people who got caught up in that case weren't down with NFL. Nobody else went to jail except who was getting money with Lee. It just so happens that G got caught up in it because he was out there one day and an undercover agent asked G where Doc was. Doc was down with Lee. He asked him where Doc was and just G just happened to say, well, he was out here just a few minutes ago. He'd be right back. For that, they have what's called a steering charge. Like you're steering traffic. You're guiding traffic towards a drug spot or a drug dealer or whatever. And they gave G a charge for that. And he was caught up in the conspiracy because of that. He went to the feds and he did his time or whatever. But, you know, that was the gist of it. That's what happened. Chapter 12, The Final Game Freshly released from prison, Lee was hell-bent on revenge. He was telling everyone that he was going to take control of the block again. One evening, he got into a heated argument with a guy named Stash. There was a rumor that G hid out in Stash's uncle's apartment after killing Big L. During the heated verbal exchange, Lee threatened to kill Stash and his uncle. Stash did not take kindly to Lee's threats. Lee was pronounced dead at the scene. G was released from prison in 2002. For a brief period of time, he worked at Murder Inc. Records. In 2011, G caught a gun charge and was sentenced to five years in prison. He was released in 2015 and moved back to 139th Street. Every now and then, you know, he'd get a vibe or whatever, you know, he, he would keep his gun on him because he didn't know if somebody was ever going to try him because of the Big L situation. Or maybe try him for some other shit they might have felt that he did or whatever, you understand what I'm saying? So he definitely felt there was a danger, you know. And he moved that way, he moved accordingly. But, um... You know, when he came home again this time, you know, he felt there was a danger, but he also, you know, he was on some, he was on a different, he had a different mindset, so it was like, you know, like this, it's been almost 20 years, like, I don't fuck with nobody right now, you know what I'm saying, I'm not fucking with nobody, I just want to, you know what I'm saying, been to jail three and four times and doing bed, especially doing a bed for something he ain't had nothing to do with. And just coming home from a bed. He's older now. When you get older, you're doing bids, man. But your mindset should change. If it doesn't change, then something's wrong with you. But I'm just assuming that, you know, his whole thinking was different. Like, he wasn't talking about street shit anymore. A few times that I did see him, like, he wasn't really talking about street shit. Anymore. Especially no gun shit. You know, he wasn't on that. He wasn't talking about robbing nobody. He wasn't talking about picking up his gun. I, I need to do this. I need to get some money for this. He never was doing that. You know what I'm saying? He wasn't talking about that. And, um, but he definitely felt there was a danger and, you know, him being out there and being available, being uh, vulnerable in a vulnerable state. Like, sometimes they say, you know, when you get ready to die, people know when their time is ending or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, I guess he just was like, yo, and I can't, you can't quote me on it. You know I'm, I'm just, I'm just figuring this in my, maybe his mind. So like, yo, listen, man, like whatever happens, it happens. I'm tired of looking over my shoulder or whatever. 
So I'm just going to live my life. Now, I'm not fucking with nobody. It's been this long. I'm not fucking with nobody. Nobody fucking with me. Listen, I'm just going to live. I'm not going to bother nobody if nobody bothered me. Some people didn't look at it that way. Somebody didn't look at it that way. And they saw him outside at night. He was standing outside. He's standing in the middle of the street. Somebody crept up from behind him and shot him in the back of his head. Somebody didn't want him here anymore, so they, uh, they acted accordingly. On June 23, 2016, G was gunned down as he stood outside on 139th and Lennox. He was shot three times by a hooded man. To this very day, the murders of Reg, Big L, and G still remain unsolved. This is the story of the rise and fall of the 139th Street NFL crew.